Our guest in this segment is Rick Pill. Rick is the Vice President of the Board of Governors at West Virginia University. Rick, good morning. Thanks for coming in. Good morning to all, and um, I'm glad to find out where those yellow jackets are coming from. We had a major nest uh, in the wall of our house. Oh, no. Ooh. And they ate through the wall of the house and were in the bedroom. And then we had another large nest in the ground outside, so I know to blame Bill down the river from yeah. me, send them up there. Yeah. No, this, this is on you, Bill. Yeah, that's that's downstream. I could expect them to come from your place down to my house, <laughs> but they don't they don't go upstream, Rick. I, okay. I, I don't think they swim. <laughs> Bill's not accepting any responsibility. Right. I, that's horrible. They were in your house and, yeah. and ate through the wall. That's yeah, uh, not comfortable. Yeah, remarkable. Comforting. Yeah, uh, Rick. Let's talk about West Virginia University. Obviously. Uh, much publicized as to the struggles that they are going through with uh, the budget and cost cutting. And uh, of course, there is the issues with the president as well and the vote of no confidence and such. What's the latest at WVU with Gordon Gee and with the cost cutting? Well, let me give you a quick overview. So for, for the public that may not be familiar with it, uh, I'm one of 17 people on the board of governors to our faculty. One is the uh, staff representative and one is the student body president. Thirteen are appointed by the governor uh, for four-year terms. It can be renewed for a second term, um, and it's a balanced group, and it can't be too lopsided politically. So, so I've had the honor to be on there now since um, 2019, filling an unexpired term, and now I'm in, in my first first term. So... Um, did you say struggles? Um, <laughs> I am positive person always, as you know, and I would say that uh, there are just there have been some challenges, but in the long run, this is all heading in the right direction. And the Board of Governors is charged with overseeing the academic affairs, financial affairs, and the hiring of the president. So this. Uh, so-called, and I, I think the wording is appropriate, academic reformation um, was obvious that it had to come about, and, and it started several years ago and uh, with the foresight of, of President Gee uh, and discussions and the, and the strong endorsement by the Board of Governors that we just had to change um, the academic uh, alignment at West Virginia University. And just like if you, you're General Motors and all of a sudden uh, the cars are changing where you're having electric cars or you're having hybrid cars and all you've ever made is gasoline-powered cars and then you don't and you need to take your, your financial funds and, and get your employees over to making uh, electric cars or hybrid cars, you have to make that change. And many universities are not doing that. And we saw that we needed to do that, and so we started this process before the COVID. And as you know, COVID changes everything, and it, 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 it I think in many respects, speeds things up. Uh, but as an example, when there's a huge demand for medical services, uh, a huge demand to get into the WVU nursing school, we need to put more money into the nursing school to grow enrollment there for the benefit of our state, and for the benefit of the students um, and to help people get jobs in that field. Where in, in other areas, the world has changed and the university hasn't changed for many, many, many years where there's not as big a demand in other areas. So you have to shift your resources uh, and, and be there where the demand is for the public. And, and that's been our process. Um, Rick, you mentioned you, you were starting this before COVID. Uh, why has there been such an accelerated issue of it then in the last six months? Oh, it has not accelerated in the last six months. This, is, this has been an issue for no, two or three no, years. No, I mean, the attention on it, though, at the, at the news level, the, the reporting of, of what happened and then the financial issues, why did that just emerge in the last because six months? Because it's or reached so? a peak and we're voting on it now. But, but this, this transition was obvious two or three or four years ago. Now, and it all goes back to student enrollment. But when you don't have room in your nursing department and you don't have room in your business school to expand where there's a demand and you have uh, a greatly reduced demand in your, act, in your uh, languages, for example, 
we saw that and we were in process of doing that. And then when the enrollment goes down more quickly than anticipated, that's what made it a more quickly required decision. Mm-hmm. Now, academic universities move like the government. Okay, So in my business, if all of a sudden when COVID hit and I didn't have any business, you know, I would, I would do all I could to help my employees, but I can make changes. It, it takes a year or two to make any changes in, in a public university. Now, we had substantial reductions in staff, which you're allowed to do more quickly. And we did that with a good heart and, and, and as best we could to have people with early retirements. Uh, to, and uh, so the staff has been, been reduced. But you cannot reduce faculty very easily unless you have a major review of all those academic programs. So, so that's what was necessitated here. You just don't go in and have faculty members um, uh, laid off because there aren't any students in their, ca- their field. Uh, and then when the number of students went down quicker than we anticipated, we didn't anticipate this, mm-hmm. then this, this had to not take a three- or four-year process. We had to take the next step more quickly. And were you able to do that? Yes, and it and it created some concerns for a lot of people. Obviously, anytime anybody loses their job, even when it's a small number of people, um, yeah, that that that's hard on everybody, and and it's certainly not an easy decision. And there's there's certainly uh, uh, sympathy for everybody concerned, uh, but you, we have to look at the good of the university in the long run. And and I certainly want to point out any of these. As it ended up, we evaluated all of the university programs. We merged some. We have just had cutbacks of professors in certain areas. And then we had to even uh, terminate a few programs. Now, Mm -hmm. WVU has 330-some majors. Now we have 310. So so those majors that are no longer in place, it's very, very unfortunate. Uh, But... In the big picture, WVU is not in stress. WVU is going to thrive. And, uh, and so the, the professors that are laid off, they're effective next April 15th. The particular professors will be notified October 15th. So they have a six-month notice. They also will get a, all employees being laid off are getting a three-month payment of their regular salary. Um, so this is being done uh, in the less, least harmful possible way to those employees and also with a great emphasis, most importantly, to be fair to all the students. Now, these programs that are being cut back are less than 1%. The majors are less than 1% for the undergraduates and less than 4% for the graduate students. None of the programs are cut out until a year from now. So anybody in grad school, although there's about 4% of the programs being cut, the, most of your grad students will graduate by next April. Um, the undergraduates that are in majors, they're certainly going to have this year, and then we've come up with a number of ways to help them um, complete their degree. At WVU? Most of them. But I'll give you an example. We have very limited number of people in uh, Arabic studies, which has been eliminated. We have very few people in Russian studies, which has been eliminated. I think we had three majors in German, which has been eliminated. So they will have this year, when those professors are still here, to complete their academic work. We are working with other academic institutions to help them create finish their degrees. One of the best language universities in the country is Brigham Young University, obviously, and they send people overseas every student for a year, so they have a great language department. So we are working with them that if somebody is halfway through their German degree, those people can take their German courses online, and they can still take all their general courses at WVU. And people are doing online studies all the time. 
So they can, if they have an apartment, they have a dorm, they love WVU, of course, they can stay there and then they can do the actual German courses online at Brigham Young or some other school. They don't have to move to Provo. Mo- no, don't have to move to Provo. Yeah, and hope, hopefully nowhere else. Bill? Yeah, uh, Rick, uh, I think one of the, there's been a difficult time for WVU. Uh, there's been a lot of confusion, a lot of criticism. But one of the more positive aspects is the Board of Governors have been very stable in your support of the president. Uh, frequently when you get a situation like this, if the governing body is silent, then it makes it even worse. You folks have not been silent. You've been supportive of uh, President uh, Gee from step one. I think that's that's kind of dampened down some of the uh, uh, some of the concerns I have. But there have been some cr- criticisms made. Uh, the faculty have been very vocal. At least one group of the faculty has been very vocal. The languages have probably been the most vocal of all the groups. And they've levied a criticism of the procedures. Uh, and a lot of the decisions have been made based upon the enrollment in, in certain curriculums. And their criticism is that a lot of the language majors are dual majors. They may be economics and language, uh, economics and Russian, for example. And the way the procedures laid out were followed, that if there were dual enrollment, dual majors, they picked up the first one listed and ignored the second one. So the language folks said their enrollment was substantially more than they were given credit for. Have you heard this criticism? you have any response? Yes, sir. Um, and I've received a large number of emails, uh, a few calls, and I've responded to anybody. And, I, and I'll be glad to do that. And I'll be, continue to be glad to do that on this or any other issues with West Virginia University. Um, the, when I told you there were 1% of the majors eliminated, that includes dual majors. And when I told you there are 4% for the graduate studies, that includes dual majors. So your dual major, um, if they're taking uh, English and Russian, they can still complete their studies, as I've indicated here, with online courses for the Russian part of it uh, at a Duquesne or at a BYU or wherever else the case might be. Now, the original, and when I say, when you said we're supportive of the president, we are. And the Board of Governors is responsible for the academic and financial affairs of the university. President Gee implements them. This, uh, he recognized the problems. He presented them to us. We saw enrollment reductions. We saw the need to expand certain departments. So this was his charge. Our charge to him was to do this. So we obviously are going to stand by him when, even before COVID, we said we need to move in this direction. So yes, I think there's almost unanimous support from the board. There is unanimous support from the Board of Governors for President Yee. And looking at the big picture, I think it's very, very, very justified. Um, Also, um, on the languages issue, you'll have people saying, oh, you only had three German majors, but you had 43 people taking German courses. Well, those courses are being taken as a general elective. So I may have German heritage. I think you and I both, Bill. Um, and, it, and it might be nice for me to take German if I want to take that as an elective. But if, if German's not there as an elective, we still now have Spanish and we have Chinese as an elective. So we think the great majority of those people that were taking courses in German, for example, or Arabic, if they want a language, they will take the Chinese or the Spanish. John Gilstrap. We hear a lot about the decrease in enrollment, and I don't know the numbers. Excuse me. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but they seem to be pretty precipitous. Um, What are we doing or what are you all doing to increase enrollment? Otherwise, it seems to me like you're just chasing a rock down the hill. And if if we can't if we can't reverse what's happening with um, enrollment, then the rest of it's not going to work. And could I build it, and picking up on what John said exactly, Marshall had a similar problem, yet Marshall is not experiencing a uh, downturn in enrollment. They concentrated very hard on both recruitment and retention. So, I disagree. Okay. Okay. If you check Marshall University's enrollment six, eight years ago compared to now, 
I don't think you're going to find it as substantial. I'm very happy for Marshall. They have a slight enrollment increase in their freshman class, which is great. Um, We had been losing about 200 freshmen enrollment per year. This year it's about, last I saw, 120. But I think you'll find that every state, every university in this state has lost substantial enrollment in the last five or ten years, including Marshall University and certainly including Shepherd University. Now, I think this year their freshman class has grown a little bit compared to the prior year. But if you compare their freshman class with ten years, it's not nearly as big. And I'm just thrilled that that Shepherd uh, is seeing that enrollment. But if you can't hold your enrollment over here with the growth that we have in the Eastern Panhandle and Frederick and Leesburg, then you can see the challenge. There are less people in this country between the years of 18 and 22 years old than people between 28 and 32 years old. That's number one issue. That's a nationwide issue. Number two, that's a nationwide issue. Number two, our state still loses people. We, we don't get a grip on that over here. But our state is still losing people. The number of high school people, high school age is lower substantially in West Virginia. And worse than that, the number going to college has dropped in the last three or four years. Now, that's not always bad. Don't, don't get me wrong here. Uh, there's a great place for Blue Ridge Community and Technical College. There are other job employments in this world that are available, um, but but that does have an effect uh, on the number of potential students in your university. We can do a better job. We will do a better job. And one of the things I mentioned to you, we have a great demand, for example, to get into our medical fields. Well, we needed the money to expand the medical fields, not, for example, the languages, and that will help us deal with this slight this dip in enrollment now when you said you didn't know how much we've lost about 200 students a year regularly our enrollment is gone from a maximum of 32,000 in 2014 to about 27 now so that's 14 percent drop but it's eight years it's about two percent a year so when you go from 5,000 freshmen to 48 and the next year to 47 that carries over the whole five years uh, during that time period, the total number of students. Mm-hmm. The other thing that's been a problem, but it's a good problem, is the students are graduating. Many more are graduating now in four years, four years in a summer, than taking five, five and a half, six years. So it's saving those students money, and money is an issue with people going to college. So we're thrilled that they're graduating quicker, but if you take 2,000 students that are graduating now that would have been in a fifth and a sixth year so every every thousand students west virginia's off you're talking 13 million dollars in tuition and maybe six million in in dorms well and rick so there's two thousand students off because they're graduating quicker but that's 40 million dollars and on top of that you have kids who are taking ap courses as seniors those count many times as college credits Uh, You've got uh, the opportunity to take community college courses as a senior, which can count as college credits. That's less money to the university. And and in addition to that, as you said, there's there's a smaller student pool uh, as well, which begs the question, and those projections are obviously available years in advance as to what the birth rate is in the country. The criticism of Dr. Gee, even on our Facebook page, is why project out to 40,000 students and build uh, go on, a, go on a, a building campaign at the university to maybe accommodate for that kind of growth when the projections are there are fewer students that were going to be in the pool? Well, I make, uh, I make a mistake or two every day, and so is Gordon Gee. So I think he made a mistake saying that we would have a, a possibility of 40,000 students. Now, when he came, we had 28 and we went up to 29, 30, 31, 32. So he saw a lot of good things, a lot of expansion, and the positive attitude is good. Do I think that was realistic? N- n- no. And, and I think from a public relations point of view, um, he's been criticized for that, and, and justifiably so. With that said, we didn't go crazy spending money <laughs> expecting, without question, 40,000 enrollment in 2025. 
there was money spent on the uh, Reynolds uh, Hall, the College of B&E, which is at its largest enrollment now. There's been sp money spent on the medical fields. Um, so uh, dorms, there were, we probably, we've dropped off because of COVID a little more. So there was probably, I think in retrospect, we spent a little money on dorms that we could have avoided. But the name of the game on dorms now is it's not like when I was in college and myself and my roommate would be in a room this big. If you do that, they're going to go to another school. Mm -hmm. So everybody's got to have their own private room. They've got to have electronics in it. It has to be accommodated. And today's children are not – nobody shares a room at their home. They're used to a private room. So we spent more money on dorms that was needed and um, – and, and perhaps there was a small expenditure there. But this, this, this problem is not based upon overspending, and we do not have empty buildings set, setting places. Legislature, they've been criticized by the West Virginia Center for Budget and Policy about not contributing um, in, to the past uh, what they contributed, and that's led directly, they think, to a big chunk of the $45 million deficit. Do you also hold the legislature accountable? I agree the amount of money that the legislature is appropriating for higher education has gone down. Um, it's a philosophical issue, but I'll give you an example. Um, WVU got from the legislature in 2013 $129 million. This past year we got $115 million. Okay. Is that inflation adjusted or real no, dollars? No, that's real dollars. So it's worth even less. Though. So that's 12% drop in real dollars. If you evaluate it overall, the, the legislature was appropriating about 13% of the budget for WVU in 2013. Now they're appropriating 9% of the budget. Okay. So, yes, absolutely, if the percentage was still 13 And by the way, 20, 30 years ago, it was over 20%. 20% of W's budget was funded by the legislature. So, yes, if they were still funding 13% of the budget, we would not have a any deficit now. Now, we'd still have to watch the enrollment in the future. With all that said, I am not being critical of the legislature. Uh, I'm very cognizant of putting your money where it needs to go. And I don't know if it's fair to take – $40 million of taxpayers' dollars from a guy working at General Motors or working at some other plant here locally and subsidizing people to go to West Virginia University, particularly if we're not making good use of our money. We can't have, we can't have one professor, a grad assistant, and a secretary when you have three majors in Germany. That is, you know, that is not good use of your money, and it's certainly not good use of taxpayers' money. So to solve this budget deficit, there were several ways to do it. Number one, the legislature giving us $45 million, and I just don't think that's fair for the taxpayers, so I have no criticism there. Number two, raise every student's tuition by $2,000. $2,000 times 27,000 students, $54 million. No problem. Well, next year, we still have the recurring issue. Number three is all the professors that are there take a 7 to 10 percent pay cut, okay? All those things are Band-Aid approaches. They don't solve where we can expand the fields where there is a need for people and students in our state. Um, so, so I think the other alternatives – were not realistic and it wasn't a problem solving way to do it in the long run we are just about out of time rick any final thoughts on the future of wvu and the money issues absolutely you, you, we started out saying all the struggles of wvu wvu is the leader in this transformation now and that's why it's been such a national issue so if you watch by the way rutgers minnesota kansas kansas state marshall a little bit penn state pitt Penn State and Pitt have moved students from their small campuses to their big campuses. They're all losing money. This We are a leader at WVU with this. Gordon Gee is a great president. He's been all around to many universities. Other universities are going to do just what we did. And I will say that West Virginia is standing tall. Our bond rating's good. 
Our WVU hospitals are fantastic in serving the public, which is one of the duties of a land-grant university. Graduating students quicker is a good thing for the students. So we're expanding our medical, business, cybersecurity, and other fields. WVU will hold steady with its enrollment, and or would grow if it wasn't for the, for the limitations. The university will be doing just fine. Thanks so much for coming in, Rick. Thank you. Rick Bill, Vice President of the Board of Governors at West Virginia University. This